again, time to take a look at Saturday's front pages. Joining me this morning is the journalist Thomas Copeland and the broadcaster Badisha. Thomas, Badisha, good morning to you both. Thanks a lot for getting up so early for us. Um, Thomas, do you want to start with, um, what is it, the front page of the Times? What are they saying about this Russian helicopter and what the Ukrainians used to shoot it down? That's right. The Times are running with a story they've got from the Military of Defence sources this morning. The UK's most advanced portable missile system is understood to have taken down a Russian helicopter in the east of Ukraine. Footage there shows the missile is called Star Streak, and it's actually made here in Belfast by a company called Tails Fails, uh, cutting down a Russian aircraft, slicing it in two in midair. Apparently, the technology which is supplied by the UK has been in Ukraine for about a week now. The MOD has sent a team of fairly experienced operators were told in this article to a country neighbouring Ukraine to train Ukrainian soldiers on how to use this technology. It's expected uh, that the way the system works is, is it's actually fairly guided by the operator, unlike US systems, which are sort of heat-seeking. It's quite it, difficult and complicated to use. We're told in this article it's meant to take two to three weeks uh, to be trained in how to use this system. It looks like, according to the Times this morning, it's taken these Ukrainian soldiers between one and two. It's guided by the soldiers themselves, which makes it much more complicated to use, but much more effective. Um, to be frank, you know, it's a bit of a morbid achievement to be celebrating, and certainly when I think of Global Britain, maybe it's not the case that you want weapons to be at the very top of that list, but when you see some of the images that have been circulating in the media over the last couple of days of, of, of civilian casualties in some of those areas, previously held by Russia, now retaken by Ukraine. It, it, it's fairly clear that this is a war that the West needs to win, not least for the people of Ukraine. So if that means more military technology coming from Britain, I can't see very many people objecting to that. Mm. Uh, and on the same um, topic, Badisha, there's been so much said, hasn't there, about Putin's frame of mind, what he's been doing during the pandemic, being completely secluded in his Black Sea palace, and those images of that table. But on the front of the Telegraph, there's an investigation that has made some claims about his health, isn't there? Yeah, this is a slightly strange one, and I'm always a bit suspicious of whenever there is a dictatorial or an authoritarian leader, and they do exactly what authoritarian leaders do, the rest of the world speculates about whether they're mad, bad, sad, and dangerous, and all the rest of it. They look for reasons, essentially, but new documents that have been released show that over the past year, a thyroid cancer specialist doctor had been sent over to Putin's Black Sea retreat over 35 times. So there have been speculations since around September of last year when he disappeared from public view for a month about his bloated appearance, his strange uh, way of expressing himself, his odd mannerisms. Now, I take all of that with a pinch of salt because also in this document leak is a very peculiar claim about Putin, sorry to say this before breakfast, bathing in blood extracted from deer's antlers as some sort of quack remedy for whatever it is that's wrong with him. Now, the reason I'm skeptical about all of this is that never in any diagnostic manual has it been said that if you're suffering from thyroid cancer, do you then want to invade your neighbors and invade Ukraine? So one thing does not relate to another. And while it's very tempting to look for justifications and excuses for this kind of behavior. At the end of the day, one thing isn't related to another, and Putin has to take full responsibility for what he's actually doing, regardless of any health issues. Hmm. Yeah, it is an interesting one, and it, I don't think it's going to go away, is it? Putin's state of mind and the many... Um, yeah or the much discussion about it. But this this story about Rishi Sunak, page two of the mail, um, Thomas, you've chosen this one. This does actually link to Russia, doesn't it? It's about some shares that his wife has in a company that's owned by his father-in-law and the fact that it's taken quite a while for them to agree to pull out of Russia. It's a complicated story, one that's been rumbling on for maybe a week now, I think, after being initially raised on Sky News by Sky News. So this is a tech firm founded by the Chancellor's father-in-law, Infosys, in which the Chancellor's wife and father-in-law hold stakes which are worth over £10 million apiece. This is a firm that's now pulled out of Russia, uh, just as of last night, actually. The Treasury has previously pointed out that the Chancellor's wife and father-in-law were just one of thousands of minority stakeholders. They didn't have any 
operational control over the company. But I mean, critics have pointed out it'd be right to do so to suggest that uh, the Chancellor's household benefiting in some way from business being done in any way, shape or form in Russia rather undermine the government's message. Uh, And Sunak, he's been reacting pretty strongly to this in recent days, actually comparing himself to Will Smith, pointing out that unlike Smith, he didn't get up and slap anyone uh, who uh, launched a criticism of his wife. It's an unusual uh, criticism. It's an unusual response to make. Uh, Pretty uncharacteristic, I think, in in British politics that there's some fairly big distinctions between having alopecia and benefiting to a sum of 12 million from a company operating in Russia. Nonetheless, I mean, this is a company who said they were, weren't were working with any Russian enterprises. They were keeping their office open uh, to help service global customers. And in any case, it's clear they've clearly now changed their minds. They've come under a huge amount of public pressure, huge amount of public scrutiny, and have closed down their operations in Russia. And no one got slapped. So I suppose, I mean, that's the bright side, isn't it? <laughs> If there is a bright side. Uh, Badisha, what do you think? Do you think that the criticism was unfair and do you think that they've taken quite a while to pull out of Russia? No, I think what's happening is fair enough because what's being uncovered exactly as as we've just uh, heard implied is that the integration between the upper echelons of uh, the UK economy and power and political power and Russian money are really quite complex. This is exactly why the UK is having a little bit of trouble disentangling itself from all of its various business interests and oligarchs that have lovely empty houses in London. No one on the planet is implying that Rishi Sunak or his family are somehow in with Russia or corrupt or taking any kind of payment that's not uh, 100% legal. But the implication is that if you're rich, you're going to invest in a range of uh, high-yielding businesses and enterprises And you need to be very careful about following each one down to its very roots because uh, the old saying is a true one. No great wealth is ever totally 100% clean. Mm. Okay, Padisha, let's stay with you. The Express, what are they saying about possibly the most depressing story, this cost of living crisis that we're all experiencing? Yeah, you know, we've been talking a lot about the super wealthy, but actually the overwhelming majority of people in the country are not in any way super wealthy. They're about to be hit by the hardest uh, bill rise in generations. In fact, you've even got the spokespeople from major utility and fuel companies like Utilitar Energy who are quoted in this article saying that this is the worst crisis for an entire generation. So everyone was rushing to get their gas and electricity meter readings yesterday because the average household is going to see an increase in £700 per year in their fuel bill. This is on top of inflation being above 6%. This is on top of a rise in national insurance. It's on top of rises in bills for gas, water, food, electricity, mobile, broadband, you will have people, people at either end of the scale, so little children and people who are in their last 10, 20 years of having to pay all of their bills, I don't like these phrases, pensioners, OAPs, I find it very ages, uh, who are going to have to choose between what? Heating, eating, and using the internet. Heating, eating, and watching the TV so they can watch the news. These are dilemmas that no person in a society in the 21st century should have to go through. And it's really, really stark that the head of a utility company is not offering any consolation in all of this. I think politicians, people who work in the fuel industry and in retail, all the rest of it, are united in saying there are tough times to come. There really are. And this is something picked up in the Telegraph on page eight, Thomas, isn't it? Quite an alarming warning, but understandable, isn't it? When people get desperate, they do desperate things. What are they saying? Well, Badisha mentioned there a stark warning. I mean, this one came out of the blue ever so slightly for me as a reality check. Energy mm. company Utilita, which has heard them there mentioned, has been forced to tell consumers not to attempt to heat their homes with barbecues or makeshift open fires. Obviously, Badisha just talked about it there, huge rise in energy bills coming, estimated to be around £600 more per household. So Bill Bullen, who's the chief, chief executive of Utilita, has been forced to tell his consumers or reinforce to consumers just how dangerous it is to use open 
open fires, barbecues, makeshift fires in your own home to attempt to provide some heat at a time uh, when gas and electricity are just so expensive. And this is one of a number of interventions from utility, energy, gas companies in the last couple of, of, of weeks. Uh, that have now become rather embarrassing, and, and as Badisha mentions, there it should not be the case in a you know a modern and advanced economy. Uh, SSE in January had to delete a blog post that recommended to people that in order to stay warm they should cuddle their pets or uh, eat lentils, chilies, and whole grain. Uh, the company Eon had to apologise after it sent its customers all out a pair of socks, clearly you know encouraging them to use that perhaps instead of switching on their heating. It is the case, and it will be the case that the most vulnerable and this is in society will not be able to heat their homes and that is very very dangerous life-threatening in some cases and I, I don't think either the government or indeed many people who will be picking up the bills as they come through the letterbox uh, later on this month have quite realized the extent to which this will have a massive impact um, on, on people across the UK it is a generational crisis the question is is enough being done Okay, well, we've come to the end of the hour. We're going to leave it there. James, those are gorgeous flowers, I have to say. They have brightened up my Saturday morning. Thank you so much. <laughs> we'll see you both next hour. Thanks a lot, James Padisha. It's still the Commons Sky News Breakfast. It's obviously Thomas, not James. We'll bring you the latest from Ukraine. As the Red Cross says, they'll try again today to rescue civilians trapped in the besieged city of Mariupol.